Dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we are going to talk about introduction and historical perspective of plant tissue culture under the paper on plant biotechnology and crop improvement. Some of you must be wondering why are we going through the historical perspective when plant tissue culture is something which we all know or rather we have moved much ahead to genes and genetic makeup and so on. The objective of going through the entire journey of plant tissue culture is so that you appreciate how the tissue culture as such developed. Even sometimes as scientists we say seeing is believing but somewhere there is space for speculation like you in a way you your gut feeling what is it it might be happening because of a certain reason. Then one of the things which each scientist should have is import, understand is importance of observation because when you are doing research it is not that you have predefined answers to yourself. And when you are developing your experiment, you really have to observe very carefully what is happening over there. You have to observe what you are expecting as well as something which you haven't expected before. And that can lead to a discovery which no one had anticipated before. And that is what is happening in all circles of science. Something which was, was discovered 50 years back and found no application at that stage is finding application today. You must be wondering that if we all start our life from one cell, then what is it that something is leaf which is photosynthesizing? Somewhere seeds are formed, somewhere flowers are formed. So there are different kinds of organs being formed. So how is it possible? Is it possible or whatever changes are happening, are they permanent or that is something which can be reversed? I suppose that's quite a genuine question that even a small child will be asking today. And what is happening when we say that leaf photosynthesizes and the stem doesn't photosynthesize, then what is happening at the subcellular level? So isn't it it's worth its scientific curiosity? So the question is why leaf photosynthesizes, root absorbs water and stem transports it? So what is happening at the cellular level? Are there cellular changes which are permanent? Is it more of adaptation? So that is what scientists way back in, in the end of 19th century, they became curious about. Now coming to how we all start our life. In sexual reproduction, it is through the mating of male and the female gamete and which forms the zygote. Now you must be wondering that irrespective of, we are talking of two gametes combining. So each gamete has half the number of chromosomes that the adult organism has. And then when the zygote is formed, it has the same number of chromosomes as his parent, either of the parents. So that's how the chromosome number is maintained. And that is possible through two kinds of divisions, one called mitosis, where the chromosome number remains the same. And the other is meiosis where the chromosome number is reduced to half. When you see a plant, you find it has stem, it has branches, leaves and every organ has a permanent position. So way back in 1878, Wao Ching, he had done a classical experiment. Is it that polarity acts in a particular way? Is it that if you put a small cutting upside down, will it still form roots from the upper cut end or it will form root from the lower cut end. So the cutting was two cuttings from the same plant were taken. One was placed the way you the cutting should be. The polarity was such that the lower cut end should form the roots. But in the other cutting, it was placed upside down. Now, what do you expect? Some of you will say the root should emerge from the top, while some of you will say perhaps it should form roots from the lower cut end. And what was actually observed that the roots emerged from the lower cut end irrespective of what the polarity was. So which shows in a way in the plant body different functions are taken based on the convenience at that stage. So immediately scientists they started thinking perhaps we can study the impact, the effect when we 
keep them in isolation. They shouldn't be under the influence of the surrounding tissue because there will be some influence. Now let's see how the plant tissue culture developed. There was a German botanist by the name Herbert Land, whom today we call father of plant tissue culture because of large number of discoveries he made. He started with fully differentiated cells from pellicid tissue as well as epidermis tissue, epidermal hair, and tried to grow them in isolation. Now, what he observed that these cells, they grew further, they changed their shape, the thickening of the cell wall occurred, but unfortunately, he didn't discover grow any further division of those cells. Now, the question arises that he tried his level best. He, wa he was able to isolate the tissue. He was able to put them onto a culture media, able to sterilize those and put them in aseptic media. But why he failed to get any growth? The reason for that was that he started with a highly differentiated tissues, number one. Number two is that the solution or the media he used, it was simple knobs solution with very few salts and sucrose. And therefore, the plant was not, perhaps was not getting any nutrients. And third, which you'll learn later, is that there were no growth hormones present in the media. But Heberland was so intelligent that even at that stage, he realized that something was missing and he said might be there were growth enzymes because see Harmon was known as that stage and he said that some growth enzymes are present in the plant which support growth of various tissues. So students, won't you appreciate someone even to speculate that something beyond nutrients is there which he postulated, he gave the name growth enzymes. And that reminds me of Charles Darwin, who once said that I'm a firm believer that without speculation, there is no good original research. Now, why I'm emphasizing on this particular point, which is also important for you, while you are experimenting, keep your eyes and ear open and look into what else can be there. I'll take you to altogether a different discipline now, and that is of embryo culture. In this module, we'll be discussing about crop improvement. And as student of crop improvement, you'll realize that you want to get traits from different organisms. Earlier, it was the plants which can hybridize among themselves. That is how people were getting hybrids or developing different varieties out of it. But then scientists were also equally curious can we develop something? And you'll learn that there are barriers at different stages. There is barrier at the fertilization stage and that pollen tube may not grow. There are barriers once the embryo is formed because embryo need nutrients. But that embryo fails to grow if they are from wide parents. So another area of research which was can we isolate these young embryos? Can we isolate them and make them grow to maturity and get a hybrid which otherwise is not possible in nature? And that is what is embryo culture technique. Hennig, way back in 1904, excised nearly mature embryos of Raphinus sativus and Raphinus lendra and grew them till maturity on artificial media. Now, these are not hybrids. This, these embryos would have otherwise grown as well. So then came another landmark discovery of Lyback. And what he demonstrated was the practical application of embryo culture. He isolated embryos from the non-viable seeds, which was a cross of two linum species. And he was able to grow them to maturity on a artificial media. So that is a hybrid which otherwise would not have been possible in nature. So one was able to achieve that. Now, it was very difficult to grow because the embryo is such a small tissue. It's very difficult to understand its nutrient requirements. And therefore, many other plant tissue culturists, they failed to grow hybrid embryos. Then came another important discovery by Van Overbeek and his team in 1941. 
and they found that the coconut milk is favors embryo development in large number of species. The first species which they identified was Dhatura, but that opened door for many other tissue culture scientists to grow cells which otherwise were not possible. This was followed by other important discoveries of Raghavan and Tori and uh, thereafter Nordstog that young it is possible to grow young embryos on synthetic media. As I said earlier, there were different lines of research being pursued. So someone was trying on the embryo side, someone started thinking, why not roots? They are one of the things which grow all through the life of the plant. So whether it's small, whether it's big, there is wear and tear and they keep on growing. So why not to try them in tissue culture as well? In 1922, root culture was another area of research that was pursued independently by Robbins in USA and Cote in Germany, who succeeded uh, with growing isolated root tips. Thereafter, White developed a media consisting of inorganic salts, extract of yeast and sugar. So that was White's media was another breakthrough because a synthetic media with most of the nutrients was developed. So that was an important discovery, but still it contained a yeast extract and there was attempts made to replace yeast extract and White himself succeeded few years later, replacing yeast extract with pyridoxin, nicotinic acid and thymine. Thereafter, Street and his co-workers, they developed or they said that apart from the nutrients, the plant tissues also require vitamins. And they also studied plant growth and root shoot relationship extended for about 11-12 years of studies. Discovery of growth regulators as well as vitamins favored further growth in the area of tissue culture. As I said before, Habertland, he postulated that there are growth enzymes, which today we call growth regulators. So with those discovery of IAA, Gautre was successful in growing Cambrium cells of Salix and Populus nigra on NOP solution. And further, the growth of Salix Cambrium was also possible. Gautre in 1939, he established first continuously growing tissue culture from the carrot root cambrium. In the same year, White reported the establishment of growing cultures from the tumor tissue of the hybrid of Nicotiana glauca and Nicotiana longsdorfi. And Gothrit, White and Nebercoat reported establishment of growing cultures of carrot. Now, one thing worth noticing here is that one is dealing with species which today we call easy to grow like carrot and nicotiana. Solanaceous members respond well to tissue culture. I like to mention that in mid-1930s, it was discovered that auxin is a natural growth regulator and vitamin B was found to be a very potent vitamin in plant tissue cultures and that is what favored further growth. Now, Skoog and Soy, they reported that in tobacco pit tissue culture, addition of adenine and high level of phosphate favored callous growth and bud formation even in the presence of IA. Now, indole acetic acid is an auxin which is known to inhibit shoot formation. So, the importance of this discovery was that if you manipulate other things that is adenine level, phosphate level and so on, then even in the presence of IA, you can get bud formation. So this is talking about interplay of other growth substances that you are putting in the media. Jablonski and Skoog in 1954, they discovered that all cells are not capable of dividing, especially when they are alone. So what they found that in the cambrium tissue was essential if you want pit cells to divide. So there were certain things. So either the cell is giving other nutrients to uh, the dividing cell. So that is what it was still unknown at that stage. But he discovered that you want pit cells to be present along with the cambrium tissue if you want them to divide. They carried out further tests on many plant extracts to substitute the requirement for vascular tissues. And they found yeast extract to be the most effective. They also established that the active component of yeast extract was something with properties common to purine. 
This led to an experiment where yeast extract was replaced with DNA and found that it was an exceptional source of activity than many other substances that were tested earlier. Now I'll take you through a different journey and that is can we grow single cells? Because till now we were talking of group of cells, sometimes of the same type and sometimes of different kinds. And Muir, what he tried was, can I get single cell? So there is no influence of any other cell on it. And he was able first to grow single cells from the cell aggregates in the shake cultures. So he grew them on the liquid media, he could pick up single cells. And that was, he failed many times, but then what he developed was a different technique of nurse culture technique. This technique consisted of that you are growing a callus, you are growing a cell mass, which is growing and multiplying. And on top of it, he has put a small filter paper, thin filter paper, so that the exchange of material can take place. And then on top of that filter paper, he placed single cell, which was able to divide and re-divide and form callus again. So this technique, because it's something like nursing, the callus tissue act as the nursing tissue for the single cell to grow. So this technique was called nurse culture technique. In 1960, Jones and his co-workers, they succeeded in growing single cells by making use of conditioned media. Conditioned media is the media in which tissue has been grown for some time and thus has growth factor released by the growing tissue. Thereafter, Wassel and Heberland, they raised whole plants of tobacco starting from a single cell by this technique. Skoog and Miller put forth the concept of hormonal control of organ formation. In their classic paper in 1957, they reported that differentiation of roots and shoots in tobacco pit tissue was decided by the auxin to cytokinin ratio. And thus, organ formation could be maneuvered by changing the relative concentration of the two growth regulators. Higher concentration of auxin promoting root formation, while higher level of cytokinin supporting shoot formation. It's worth mentioning here that this is an interplay of both, and thus presence of both may be required to achieve either of the response. Also, the endogenous level that is present in the tissue that plays an important role. How much of exogenous will be required because there is something which is already present in the tissue. And this concept of hormonal regulation of organogenesis, it's a reality, it is true today, and it has found application in large number of plant species. Thereafter, in 1962, Skoog and his student Murashige, what we call today as Murashige and Skoog's media, they developed a media which was rich in inorganic salts, vitamin, iron source, sugar. So they developed a complete media, which even today I'll say that 60-70% of plant tissue culturists, they are still using that formulation. So that was an important discovery and one was able to culture large number of plant species on that complete media. We call it a complete media. But still, what we found that, uh, till that stage was that there are a number of species which remain recalcitrant to tissue culture. They don't respond and therefore we call them recalcitrant. In this category, cereals and legumes, which are the most important species for which we require tissue culture, somehow they never responded to tissue culture even on that media. And it was basically that immature embryos were suitable explants for protoplast isolation and thereafter its genetic manipulation. And it was found by Sunders and Brigham that alpha-alpha uh, cultivars, they vary considerably in the regeneration potential. Like different genotypes, they'll respond differently to tissue culture. So it was that there is regeneration potential is controlled genetically as well as it depends on the physiological state of the plants. Older the tissue is, more recalcitrant it is. Now, another line of research was pursued simultaneously. Like I mentioned to you about root culture and the roots had capacity to grow indefinitely. Now, you'll appreciate that there are plants 
and with different or we call them medicinal plants. So they have certain metabolites present in them, which we require. And for many of these plants, what the only method available today is destructive, that you kill the plants because the active principle is present in the root. So the harvesting involves killing of the plant. It's present in the leaves, it's present in bark, so it can be present anywhere. And tissue culturists, they start thinking, why not to grow these cells and get the secondary metabolite? Can we do it? Can we make it synthesize that on the artificial media also? Because one was able to get cell culture, one was able to isolate single cells, grow them into callus, and the callus was producing secondary metabolites as well. The secondary metabolite production, it started way back in 1950s, the research on this, and a company, Pfizer, during 1950-60, they got interested in going for large-scale cultivation of plant cells. And the bioreactor was based on the microbiology, the principles of microbiology, how to do it, because the only thing you require here for the growing cells is some amount of light, because in microbes, they typically don't require light here. You also require light. But to limited extent, because you were one was giving sugar artificially. Bioreactors of various sizes were used. Initially, 134 liters by Tulke and Nickel in 1959. And thereafter, Nogochi, he used 20,000 liter reactor for the cultivation of tobacco cells. So Shikunin was the first commercial product that has been commercialized. It was produced from lithospermum species and thereafter ginseng and there is a whole list of species which has been commercialized thereafter. So while we thought that secondary metabolite production by plant cells will replace extraction from plants directly, but it never happened so. We could commercialize few products but failed with, with many other. But that was that the plant cells were slow growing then there was genetic instability because in bioreactor, when the cell divides, they do not divide or they are not genetically uniform. So there were abnormalities occurring and which were resulting in the production of secondary metabolite as well. The other problem was that these metabolites, they were essentially, they were getting into the plant cell, the intracellular uh, the intracellular accumulation of secondary metabolites was happening. So it be extraction became a good issue. So they were not coming into the media, the media as such, but you had to extract it from those cells. And then the quality or the content was not always the same. And you, of course, when you'll study this, you'll also realize that Part of it is happening because it's the impact of stress. Secondary metabolites are produ produced when you're more stressed. But when you're more stressed, so is the cell multiplication. So when the cell multiplication becomes slow, then it is not viable commercially. Now I'll start with the most exciting research area of plant tissue culture, which has been commercially exploited since 1970s, 1960s, 70s. It was Bell way back in 1946 who first tried to do shoot tip culture. And you'll realize that it is the terminal part of the plant and the branches where there is shoot tip present, which keeps on growing all through the life of the plant. If you injure a plant, what you find is that the side branches or the lateral bud that keeps takes the role of the terminal bud and grows further. So the shoot tip, the extreme tip with couple of leaf primordia, that was excised and put on the culture media. And it grew into a complete plantlet. Now, you'll appreciate another thing that the shoot tip keeps on dividing and the cells are meristematic. We call it meristem tip as well. So the cells are meristematic. And they have the unique capacity that even if the plant is infected with the virus, it takes time for the virus to reach the shoot tip. So if you excise the shoot tip, extreme tip, sub-centimeter, you can get virus-free plants. And scientists got interested in doing 
this particular exercise to get virus free plants from infected individuals, infected uh, mother plants. There was one scientist by the name Model who way back in 1960, he tried cultivating Cymbidium orchid shoot tip. But to his surprise, he found that the shoot tip, instead of developing into a plant, developed an unorganized structure protocom, which was similar to something which was formed during seed germination. He could chop it into smaller pieces, put it on the same media and he will again get large number of protocoms. But his objective was getting a plant and therefore he kept on changing the media. And he found that on a different media, from each protocom, there were shoots formed, three or four shoots formed, which could again be sliced and put on a different media for inducing rooting. So, what I said initially, that you have to observe things, you have to look into. So, it is a chance discovery over here. His objective was getting a plant, virus free plant, but what he got was a technology that protocoms can be multiplied indefinitely. On your wish, you can change the media and make each them grow into a plant. So, that was beginning of cloning of plants. And this technology was so powerful that cymbidiums, which at one stage prior to this, they were considered to be royal family's flower because they were so expensive. Each, most of the uh, orchids, they are complex hybrids. So, when you raise them from seeds, you do not know what kind of flower you will get at the end of the day. So, over here, one was able to clone the rare hybrids and in any number that you wanted to. So, this technology had so much of potential that all the nursery owners, they decided to go for it. They developed small tissue culture labs and starting multiplying the unique hybrids which were available in their collections. And this is the technology what we call today as micropropagation. This was largely possible because uh, of the discovery of Wixen and Thiemann. Uh, they demonstrated that the lateral buds on a growing shoot can be induced to grow on a medium containing cytokinin, thus overcoming apical dominance. Axillary bud was a preferred method of multiplication uh, because it led to plants which were more uniform. But simultaneously, there was also another school of thought and that was through callus, you can get multiplication much faster. And on certain media, it was possible to get formation of embryo-like structures, that is shoot on one end and root-like structure which grew into a root uh, on the other end. And these, since they were formed from the somatic cells, they were called somatic embryos. These somatic embryos were perceived to have a lot of application because they were like embryo and that was called synthetic seed. Why not to encapsulate them into some other nutrient media? store them and grow them like seeds. So, this was something which came with a lot of bang but with limited commercial application. So, we failed to grow them. There were issues related to genetic uniformity as well as how do you store and make them grow. The other thing which was also being worked out by scientists was, can we store these cells? Because we all talk today about biodiversity or conserving biodiversity, why not to conserve this biodiversity as cells? So, that cells and tissues, different methods were developed, short-term storage, medium-term storage, long-term storage. Long-term storage was at minus 196 degrees and scientists succeeded in regenerating cell plants out, out of it. I like to come back to what I said originally and that is never ignore any of your observations. So, initially while all through this journey of plant tissue culture, scientists were ignoring abnormal plants or abnormal behavior in cells and so on, but they were just ignoring it or saying that let's throw these cultures and grow them again. But then it is that these abnormal cells, they became source of generating new plant varieties. You will appreciate that there are a number of varieties which are multiplied vegetatively and therefore unlike those plants 
which are a product of cross-pollination where you observe a lot of variation. Over here, variation was restricted and we call it that they have very narrow genetic pool. Like sugarcane is one variety which is vegetatively propagated. So developing varieties in sugarcane is a difficult exercise. They don't occur unless and until you make an attempt yourself or a serious attempt to develop variation and it's difficult. But then what was happening when you were growing it through callus, you will get variation because the the plants, the callus cells, they divide so fast. So sometimes they are not accompanied by cell division. Sometimes the chromosome replication is not complete. So over there, the variation which you get, it is called soma clonal or gametoclonal variation. Another area of research which was being pursued was that of protoplast. You all know that plant cells, they have a very rigid cell wall outside the cell prison. So this cell wall that could be removed and what you are left with, the one which is inside the cell membrane that is called protoplast. So this discovery of protoplast was made way back in 1982 and that they could also be fused with the protoplast, these cells without cell walls, they could fuse very easily. But then the isolation of protoplast, their fusion that remained more of, you can say, an isolated discovery which no one pursued till Cocking started working on it in 1960, that he developed a method, enzymatic isolation method for isolation of protoplast. And thereafter, there were lots of other people, they got interested in going for protoplast research. And there was an hypothesis. Can we fuse protoplast from two diverse plants? The dream was, can we have a plant which produces potatoes underneath the soil and tomatoes on top? So that was the kind of potential which was realized that one will come up with varying kind of hybrids, varying kind of plants, which will perhaps double or triple productivity. But let me tell you that it came with a big bang. There was a lot of research being done, spread over a decade. A lot of scientists all along, around the globe, they worked on it. They developed various technologies, how to isolate in large numbers, how to fuse them in large numbers, and so on. But unfortunately, none of the hybrids was commercially important. Although this technology also became very potent for the development of other technologies such as that of genetic manipulation, but it remains more of an academic interest. I'll also like to mention a few other discoveries which perhaps form the backbone of today's hybridization plant breeding program. One of the discoveries which was made was by Guha and Maheshwari. They developed anthraculture technique for the production of haploids. If you remember, I told you that the plant have two types of division, meiosis and mitosis. So as the product of meiosis, which are gametes, those gametes are half in number. The classical plant breeding involves fusion of two diverse kind of gametes, two parents. And with the result, you get hybrid, which has half the chromosomes coming from mother and half the chromosomes coming from parent. When you dis- develop a plant, maybe you require 95% blood from one parent and maybe 5% or less than that from the other parent. So in that case, you keep on back crossing, which becomes a tedious exercise. All the time, you go back to the parent where you want 95% of the blood, but which 5% is coming, you have to spend a lot of time in the field. So one of the things that people thought that can we cultivate, can we grow these cells which have half the number of chromosomes. Can we grow them? And where are those gametes? So pollen or anther, which has half the number of chromosomes, that became an important thing. And so this discovery has a lot of potential. Now, of course, that was one was growing it, but then the other thing was, can we get haploid plants out of it? The cells, can we duplicate that chromosome number and get a plant which will have both the chromosomes with same character? Uh, I'm happy to inform you that this particular technology has led to large number of commercially important hybrids 
which has played a very important role in the crop improvement. And again, coming back to that, you should observe what is happening in nature. And scientists observe that there is something called crown gall, that many of the plants, they develop. Initially, it was considered to be a disease. They call it gall disease because there are some callus formation on the stem, roots, and so on. And it was found that it is due to a soil bacterium, the gram-negative soil bacterium, agrobacterium, which is freely available in the soil. And then that this particular microbe, bacterial genome, that gets integrated into the plant genome and that leads to the gall formation. So scientists start thinking, can we tag some other DNA along with it? And will that also get integrated into the genome? And this opened the whole area of genetic engineering. So this particular DNA segment, which was getting incorporated into the plant genome, was called TI plasmid. So dear students, you must have enjoyed going through the journey of plant tissue culture. It doesn't stop where we have stopped today. There are lots of other discoveries which have been made thereafter, but all built on this information which was generated by scientists about a century ago. You can say plant tissue culture is the heart of biotechnology. Whatever you will also learn in the next few lectures about genetic engineering of plants, gene editing technology and so on. But whatever lit plant you produce that needs to be cloned. And that is what was micropropagation. Micropropagation, which was built on the knowledge of developing plant media, discovery of growth regulators, and so on. So that is what is the backbone of modern plant breeding. Because we need to combine new technologies with the old technologies. And those principles which were discovered long back uh, will be guiding us all through. With this, I like to end today's lecture. Happy reading and thank you.